Hey everybody, welcome to the final recording for uh, the helping class this semester. We're going to cover the second of the two dangers, and this one is enmity. The reason we're talking about this, well first let me define enmity. Enmity is hostility, hatred, ill will for another. Um, the reason we're talking about enmity is because sometimes making enemies feels like helping. It's a natural response to have when you see someone imposing suffering or injustice on another person. It makes us think that the immediate and obvious best way to help is to fight. And it depends on what you mean by fighting, um, it, whether or not you're accurate. Uh, I think there's an idea that the solution is to destroy enemies um, rather than to change your behavior or win them over. And so let's talk about um, an example of a different approach to en en enemies and to enmity in the form of nonviolent resistance. Nonviolent resistance has a pretty long history. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. applied it perhaps most famously in the civil rights movement. And even though it has this long history, he did a great job of articulating these six principles of nonviolent resistance that illustrate how you approach a situation where there are people that would consider themselves to be your enemies or somebody else's enemies. When resisting um, injustice um, or, or imposed suffering like this, um, he identified these six things. First of all, that uh, nonviolent resistance is a way of life for courageous people, acknowledging that nonviolent resistance requires a great deal of courage. That it's uh, a way to win friendship and understanding that that's its purpose isn't to destroy people, but to win them over, uh, to turn the enemies into friends. Um, its purpose is also to defeat injustice, but not people. So it's not that you have a vendetta out for anybody in particular or any group of people in particular, but rather that you're trying to bring an end to injustice itself. Um, suffering is often a part of nonviolent resistance and its purpose is, and the goal of nonviolent resistance is to elevate or transform suffering into something that can educate and then lead to reform. It's something that chooses love instead of hate. Hate doesn't have a place within nonviolent resistance and uh, also has a faith that the universe is on the side of justice. And that if you persist in nonviolent ways, that justice will be the ultimate goal. Uh, he liked to quote, uh, there's a quote that's often attributed to Martin Luther King. It's actually, <clears throat> it actually goes, is attributable to a, to an abolitionist pastor of the early 1800s, like their first version of it. And I've forgotten this other pastor's name, but anyway, um, the quote that's often attributed to Martin Luther King is um, that the arc of history is long but it bends toward justice, illustrating that last principle. Um, you know, the civil rights movement is one example, but there are many other examples in history of nonviolent movements, uh, Indian independence from Great Britain. Gandhi's leadership of uh, independence in India actually became the inspiration for Martin Luther King, and King actually studied with Gandhi to learn about the basic principles of nonviolent resistance. The women's suffrage movement in the United States is a great example of nonviolent resistance leading to justice. Obviously, the civil rights movement in the U.S. The Velvet Revolution in the Czech Republic was another example of nonviolent resistance. And then finally, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa um, was, there was a fair amount of violence there, but it wasn't the practice, but the violence was not encouraged by the anti-apartheid leaders like Mandela. And, and Tutu and the others. So what we can see is that there are a lot of examples of nonviolent resistance leading to pretty large scale change in implementing more just outcomes um, and to reduce human suffering. And so this idea that the only way to fight is violently, um, especially if it's in response to violence, um, is, not, is not actually true when you look historically. Now that's not to say that violence is always wrong in response to violence. Um, you know, there are uh, moments in history when uh, defending yourself, for example, is is sometimes necessary, but it doesn't require hatred or the other things that go along commonly with enmity. And I think the danger of looking for examples of where violence is justified is that it then becomes a justification for violence in far less pressing circumstances.
right? Where, um, where suffering is happening, but there might be other alternatives. Just like claiming that violence is justified in one setting doesn't automatically mean it's justified in every setting. How effective is enmity as a solution anyway? If you're a helper, if you have people whose lives you want to improve or change, and you see others being a part of the reason for that suffering that's happening in their lives, uh, if you use enmity or anger, how effective is it in leading to change? Well, the answer is typically not very effective at all. Uh, anger, for example, which often motivates helping, um, is frequently more destructive than the event that provoked it, according to Seneca, a philosopher. There's actually a myth that anger and the expression of anger, uh, sorry, the expression of anger dissipates anger. This is called the catharsis. This is called catharsis, but it's actually a myth. The research shows that it's not true. Um, it's, it's much more common that expressing anger actually enhances it rather than dissipating it. And so this idea that you have anger, you just need to sort of let out and let the anger go free. Now, I should say that like letting anger take hold of you is, is the catharsis myth. Saying things that have bothered you, frustrated you is different. Um, and that can actually be productive, but sort of letting anger take hold so that you can like blow off steam, that's a, that's a myth that doesn't actually blow off steam. It, it actually just foments more anger. And the reality is the, the way we appraise or view a situation is what influences our anger over it. And there are more productive ways to view a circumstance uh, that uh, don't lead to anger. And so anger is both bad for us in a variety of ways, and it's also addictive because uh, we find it satisfying psychologically, and so we stick to it. This is why so much media is built around anger, is because anger is such an addictive experience. Um, anger also, it's worth noting, uh, usually comes from some other reason. Uh, when you think about why you get angry, it's because of reasons like this, fear, powerlessness, disrespect, betrayal. Um, but my favorite description of this emotional aspect of anger is that it's a secondary emotion. Anger is usually an emotional response to some other negative emotion that we're experiencing. So we're we're feeling any of the things, for example, on this list, and then it and then the second response, emotional response, is anger to our circumstances. Anger is also ethically dangerous. It induces certainty. When we're angry, we're sure, we're confident that our perspective is right. It's pretty hard to be angry, but also to doubt yourself. And that kind of certainty can reduce uh, ethical decision-making. And the research shows that anger reduces the evaluation of, deci of decisions. So you're going to spend less time thinking about whether or not a choice is a good choice. It increases punitive judgments, which means you're more likely to jump to a conclusion about somebody else being wrong and, and deserving punishment. And it also increases deceptiveness. People who are angry are more likely to lie. The problem is that enmity is also alluring. Enmity draws us in. It, it um, is attractive and enticing, and because it has this effect, uh, we're, we uh, can fall prey to it. Um, there's this great concept from Buddhism uh, that says that for all virtues that exist, there's far enemies, and these are sort of like the things that stand in stark opposition. But then there are also, for virtues, there are near enemies. And near enemies are 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 sort of like uh, ver they're bad they're vices that feel like virtues. And enmity is a great example of a vice that feels like a virtue because if you are righteously angry, right, um, then uh, if you're righteously angry, you sort of you emphasize the righteousness part uh, in response to it and tend to ignore the anger part. And uh, in this sense, you can think of righteous enmity as a near enemy of virtues. The reality is that enmity is alluring because it's convenient. It frees us from chores like civility, patience, and love. If you, can, if you have somebody you hate, you don't have to treat them with kindness or patience. Uh, enmity is also very soothing because it always lays the blame on others instead of ourselves. If something is wrong, the enemy is the reason that something is wrong, not because of any contribution we made. And it's also intoxicating. It clouds our judgment. It blurs our vision. It's, it's like a drug. And all of us have felt this. You've had moments probably where you've just been intensely angry, and it's as though you're drunk with anger. 
Um, and in fact, the scriptures at times describe it this way. I think Isaiah describes it this way. And so, so we drunken on anger, you can see how it would just lead us into so many bad decisions. Fundamentally, the danger of enmity is that it rationalizes any bad behavior because your enemy is always worse. As long as there's an enemy to hate, there's nothing you can do that's bad enough, especially if everything you do is in the interest of defeating the enemy. So enmity feels like helping for all these reasons we've talked about, but it isn't usually helpful. Oh, very rarely, if ever, is it helpful. And so we got to talk about how to avoid enmity so you can be a better helper. Uh, the first thing is to enhance your capacity for forgiveness. Uh, there are a lot of really powerful stories of forgiveness, but one of my favorite involves uh, John Lewis. So John Lewis was a member of Congress before he passed away, but he also, in his youth, was a civil rights activist. He was a freedom writer. So the freedom writers were individuals who would basically travel the South to challenge unjust uh, laws around segregation. And so when John Lewis was only 21 and was a freedom writer, he traveled to Rock Hill, South Carolina in 1961 and, and was beaten badly. One of the men who beat him at that, um, uh, at that uh, I think it was a bus station where he got beat up, if I remember right, was a man named Elwin, Elwin Wilson. Wilson in this picture is the man sitting next to John Lewis uh, looking at that book with him. And uh, what happened was, is Wilson came forward many decades later to apologize. He came to John Lewis and basically said, I'm sorry, I was one of the men who beat you at that, at that uh, bus station. And, and he essentially asked for John Lewis's forgiveness. The way Lewis describes that interaction, he says this, without a moment of hesitation, I looked back at him and said, I accept your apology. And he continued, when you can truly understand and feel, even as a person is cursing you to your face, even as he's spitting on you, or pushing a lit cigarette into your neck, or beating you with a truncheon, all of which are things that happen to John Lewis. If you can understand and feel that your attacker is as much a victim as you are, that he's a victim of the forces that have shaped and fed his anger and fury, then you're well on your way to the nonviolent life. Anyway, it's just a beautiful and potent story and uh, one that I'd encourage you to look more into if you're interested. I have some links in the notes for the slide deck. So forgiveness is one of the ways we can avoid enmity, quite simply forgiving our enemies, which is also a, a, a doctrinal injunction that we all have. Um, compassion, we've already talked a lot about it. Compassion is a great antidote to enmity. Um, as long as we recognize and are willing to acknowledge that the targets of our enmity deserve our compassion. And you can cultivate compassion for enemies as well. And the Buddhist practice of loving kindness meditation actually often incorporates a step for showing compassion to our enemies. MLK just said this, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. I love that quote. And then the last sort of antidote I'd recommend to enmity is humility. The theologian Franz Rosenweig, uh, in a letter to his future sister-in-law, wrote this, and I love this. He said, each of us can only seize by the scruff whoever happens to be closest to us in the mire. This is the neighbor the Bible speaks of. And the miraculous thing is that although each of us stands in the mire of ourself, we can each pull out our neighbor, or at least keep him from drowning, the great hand from above supports all these holding human hands by their wrists. None of us has solid ground under our feet. Each of us is only held up by the neighborly hands grasping us by the scruff. There is no such thing as standing. There is only being held up. Uh, paraphrasing, we're all sinners. We all have flaws and failures, um, you know, human foibles. And recognizing that about ourselves allows us to have more mercy for the people around us, in particular those who've offended us. So if our instinct is to fall into enmity, even if, again, we think it's helping, the problem is that we absolve ourselves of needing any sort of humility. And so it's better to get rid of enmity and shed that so that we can make room for the humility that, uh, that we need to have.
I'm curious, you know, what else from your readings help us avoid avoid enmity? And this is something we'll talk about and when we meet in class. We'll also discuss some doctrinal principles about it. I look forward to seeing you all then.